Hello, this is uh, Joseph Holbrook, and uh, I'm going to start a new series tonight about U.S. Latin American relations. And uh, I'm doing this because right now Venezuela is in the news, and our administration is cracking down on Cuba. There's also unrest in Nicaragua and Honduras. And so uh, I've been in conversations with some friends explaining some of the complicated history of U.S. Latin American relations and why I think uh, nine times out of ten military intervention, actually I probably think ten times out of ten, but nine times out of ten military intervention is a bad idea. So a few years ago I uh, taught a class called uh, LEH. 3718 that's Latin American history 3718 it was a it was a history class specifically introducing US Latin American relations over the last two centuries so I want to use some of my notes from that course to try to get into the background of US uh, relations with Latin America and why they are fraught with tension and complex and why it's really important that we rethink the way we operate as a country in terms of other, other uh, our relationships with other smaller nations. Okay, so um, I also want to mention, I think I've mentioned this elsewhere, but uh, this class that I taught a few years ago was kind of the beginning of my Clint Eastwood philosophy of history, which is uh, basically that every country, every empire, every religion, every historical actor, every historical epoch has its good, and you can probably guess the rest of it. It's bad and it's ugly. And uh, I'm sorry to say that in this particular theme of U.S. Latin American relationships, there might there is some good here and there, but uh, the bad by far predominates. And there's a few episodes in U.S. Latin American relationships that are relations that are downright ugly. So, without further ado, let's uh, jump into it. If I can remember how this works, there we go. So, I'm going to go into the the past a little bit and give some historical background before we get specifically to the era of U.S. Latin American relationships or relations. So with the discovery of the of the Western Hemisphere there was an early race between Spain and Portugal to try to uh, achieve um, the imperial lead let's say in to try to achieve world empires. And of course, uh, uh, Spain through Christopher Columbus discovered the Bahamas and Cuba and Hispaniola and the, uh, what was called the Spanish main, the mainland from Venezuela up through uh, Mex Southern Mexico. And, Braz and uh, Portugal discovered the tip of Brazil and also traveled around Africa to Asia uh, creating trading posts and colonies. So Pope Alexander VI very uh, kindly divided the world in half between Spain and Portugal, both of them being Catholic nations, 370 leagues west of the Cape Verde Islands, in other words, halfway to the Bahamas. Uh, and basically the Portuguese had access to everything to the east of that line and the Spanish to the west of that line. Uh, it just so happened that the a good chunk of Brazil uh, fell east of the line which allowed the Portuguese to begin to exploit it. Uh, the, the economic philosophy of these two countries and later the English and Dutch was mercantilism. This is before the heyday of capital, modern capitalism. And the idea of mercantilism is that uh, colonies existed for the benefit of the mother country. 
So Spain exploited the, the silver mining in uh, Potosí, Bolivia, and also in uh, Guanajuato, Mexico. Uh, the English and the Dutch also exploited re uh, North America for resources. The French began to settle in Canada in the 1620s, and you had it like a five-way race for empire was on between those five European nations. At the same time, in the uh, 16th century, you had religious wars going on. Europe was tearing itself apart uh, with the Reformation. And this began to divide uh, Catholic, the Catholic Southern Europe against the Western European and Northern Protestants. But at the same time, it was a division between Latin and Anglo-Saxon. Of course, Martin Luther uh, was German and you had the uh, English Reformation. And so this theme of tension between Latino and Anglo or Anglo-Saxon goes, I just wanted to show that it goes back uh, beyond the United States and the, um, and the Spanish republics. Uh, even in, in the area of Caribbean pri piracy, Francis Drake, uh, the Dutch pirate Piet Hain, these were Protestants, and so there was a uh, even some of the French uh, uh, buccaneers uh, were Protestant Huguenots, and so they felt justified uh, in attacking the Catholic Spanish and capturing their silver and gold because of the religious war that was going on. Uh, Dutch the Dutch uh, admiral or pirate, depending on who you're talking to, Piet, uh, Piet Hain captured 16 Spanish galleons and the entire silver fleet of Spain worth 11, uh, 11 million guilders of booty. And uh, this was enough to outfit the entire Dutch army and uh, fleet and the occupation of northeastern Brazil for 40 years. 1630 to 54, the Dutch seized control of the Brazilian Northeast with its sugar plantations. Uh, England and France jumped into the race for empire after the Dutch uh, because the perception was that Spain was in decline and someone was going to take Spain's place as the number one empire, global empire. So in 1700, you had the War of Spanish Succession, 1748, you had the Great War, as it was known in some quarters in the United States, it's been known as the French and Indian War. Uh, it's also been called the Seven Years War, even though it lasted a good bit longer than seven years. It was actually, as one historian pointed out, it could be called the First World War, because the war was going on in Canada, in the United States, in the Caribbean, in India, it was truly a uh, war on a global scale between, pr primarily between English, England and uh, France. England, England came out ahead and uh, became the dominant power. If you've watched uh, Master and Commander at the, no, I'm sorry, forget that. I was thinking that that was during the uh, Seven Years' War, but it was during the Napoleonic Wars that Master and Commander at the far end of the sea uh, was was filmed or was uh, set historically. The Catholic Spanish Americans found themselves face to face as a result of this war with Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-American Protestant heretics. The French left and the whole area of the Louisiana Purchase went to the United States. And so now instead of having the French as a buffer between the Spanish and the Americans, of course, the English also left after the uh, War of Independence by the 13 colonies. So the French and the English left, and you had Americans facing, Anglo-Americans facing Latino or Spanish, Hispanic uh, nations, particularly in the form of Mexico after the uh, end of the empire. 
the Portuguese Empire turned into the Brazilian Empire. The entire no, uh, no, uh, royal court of Portugal picked up and moved to Brazil in order to escape Napoleon. Uh, whenever I move this around, it seems like it's harder than to... Here we go. I have to keep moving this. In 1814, Thomas Jefferson wrote in a letter, History, I believe, furnishes no example of a priest-ridden people maintaining a free civil government. Of course, we know that Thomas Jefferson, was, he, not only was he not a Catholic, he was not an evangelical Christian as we understand it today, and sir, probably not an Orthodox Christian as well, obviously, by uh, his editing of the Bible. In 1610, the uh, Thirty Years' War broke out in Germany. Uh, one half of all males died in that war. One third of the population of Germany perished. Uh, Europe was so traumatized by the Thirty Years' War, which was a religious war between Catholics and Protestants, that at the end of it, in 1648, the, na the European nations came together and negotiated what is called the Peace of Westphalia, which inaugurated the modern international system of sovereign states or modern nation states. And many of our institutions and concepts of international relations come from this Peace of Westphalia in 1648. For one thing, uh, it was the beginning of freedom of religion. Although it was very limited, uh, it was agreed that the people of a, of a country would adhere to the religion or the church of their sovereign. In other words, English people would be Anglican, uh, following their queen or king, as the case may be, and uh, Swedish people would be Lutheran, following their king, and of course Italians would be Catholic, and so would Spanish, following their monarchs. Um, some of the consequences of the this uh, piece of Westphalia included international politics consisting of relations among nation states. Sovereign European nation states emerged out of this. This was the beginning of the modern nation state. European nations focused energy on imperial expansion. Mercantilism, also colonialism, became important as, after this time. And fourth, imperial holdings became an integral element in the calculation of the balance of power. Strategy, strategies of imperialism. France followed a conquest and enlargement policy. If you go to some of the islands in the Caribbean today that belong to France, they are actually part of territorial France. They're not just colonies. They are France. If you set your feet in Martinique, you're in France politically speaking, or legally. Uh, the British Empire followed a plan of subjugation and colonization, which you can see in the 13 colonies, later in Australia, and some, at some attempt in India. Um, there's also the creation of a sphere of interest, or an informal hegemony. And so uh, examples of this were in the partition of Africa under Bismarck, around the 1860s, I believe it was, into spheres of interest or uh, where certain parts of Africa were dominated by France, others by Germany, others by England, others by um, Belgium. Also, the uh, turn of the century, China uh, was an example of dividing up China in spheres of interest or influence. This is an informal type of uh, hegemony. Not, not brute colon, colonialism. So here are some definitions. Hegemony refers to the capacity of an actor or nation to impose its will on others without significant challenge. Nationalism uh, may be one of the few realistic defensive responses of weaker nations in the face of a dominant global superpower. That's one reason why at the end of the Towards the end of the Cold War, there was a rise of 
nationalism in places from such as India all the way to uh, Peru. The response of Latin American nations to the presence and power of the United States has had few alternatives to choose from. Some have noted a curious psychology in Latin America of a love-hate relationship or love-hate attitude towards the United States and its emotional inclination to nationalism. I certainly experienced this when I lived in Colombia. The United States was a relative latecomer on the international stage, but after the War of Independence against Great Britain, the United States be became one of the first, or the first, uh, American nation in the hemis Western Hemisphere. George Washington warned the country to avoid entangling allies, alliances. Alexander Hamilton advocated developing a powerful navy. We're going to talk more about the idea of developing a global navy to have global uh, become a global player uh, in the 1890s. But Alexander Hamilton was an early proponent. Uh, a senator by the name of Rufus King wrote in 1799, I am certainly convinced if South America and its resources are not for us, they will speedily be against us. Some wanted Latin America to remain under the control of Spain because Spain was viewed as weak, honestly. England or France represented a threat. The U.S. and Latin American independence. The United States reluctantly supported Latin America um, in its independence efforts, the new nations of South America might ally, ally themselves with England or France, and so the United States felt like it was better to preempt that possibility. Uh, and these new nations looked to the United States as an example of what was possible. And during this period, uh, Latin American nations or Spanish American nations, uh, in some ways, uh, viewed, admired the United States as a uh, as a sister republic. The U.S. really didn't have... Uh, it doesn't want to move. Okay. The, it really didn't have much choice and decided that it was in their best interest that they support the South American independence efforts uh, so that they could have some influence and maybe help control it. Thomas Jefferson said, we consider their interests and ours at the same time, and that the object of both must be to, I can't read that, exclude all European influence from the hemisphere. So one, one uh, reality of international relations is power. Somehow I lost my spot here. Every nation will act according to its own best interests. If a nation tends to behave itself and play nice, it's probably because they don't have any other choice. Can anyone say Switzerland? If you're surrounded by hostile powers who have a great military force and you're unable to defend yourself, then your best bet is to be nice and to stay neutral. Uh, the United States was blessed with uh, territory, resources, and almost unlimited expansion. So it has become a... Uh, global power in ways that Costa Rica never could dream of doing. And so Costa Rica behaves differently. Uh, that's not too, well, I'm not going to go there. That gets too complicated for now. The Monroe Doctrine in 1823 uh, was elaborated. The American continents are henceforth not to be considered a subject for future colonization by any European power. This was uh, President Monroe speaking, it was aimed partly at Tsarist Russia, 
who was ex had expanded across Siberia and was beginning to uh, project itself over to the northwestern coast. Manifest Destiny is something a little bit different. Uh, it is a, it was an ideology that emerged during the early 19th century that believed that uh, now, now how did I just do that there we go that believed that the United States was destined to expand from shore to shore from Atlantic to Pacific now remember when you're the 13 colonies or and you're, and the west is the middle of middle or western end of Tennessee. Uh, the idea of stretching across to the Pacific Coast seemed a little more radical. So uh, it's a, but it was an attitude to help fuel western settlement. It also had some. Uh, so good thing is western settlement development of the western part of the United States. I used to watch Wagon Train when I was a kid, and so that's good. What is the bad? Remember we talked about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, well, War with Mexico in 1846 was pretty bad. It was, as we'll see later, it was provoked by uh, President Knox, I think it was, and uh, it was an attempt to provoke a war with Mexico in order to take land that would allow us to expand up as long as Mexico had California, then we were never going to expand to the Pacific Ocean. So war with Mexico, it was opposed by Henry David Thoreau. It was criticized as immoral and unjust by Abraham Lincoln. It's part of the historical record. I don't think it can be argued. Maybe it can be, but uh, not from my point of view. So that's bad. Ugly. Uh, Andrew Jackson and the Trail of Tears when he forced uh, when he forced Cherokee Indians and many other tribal groups to walk across the United States to um, Oklahoma and many of them died on the way on a death march that was I would call that ugly both of these are related to manifest destiny and here is a picture from 1872 by uh, John Gast called the American, I can't read that word down there, the American spirit maybe, which is an allegorical representation of manifest destiny moving westward. And of course it's shown by a beautiful young woman leading the pioneers westward. Uh, there was a TV series with uh, uh, Anson Mount recently called Hell on Wheels that showed a grittier uh, a grittier and perhaps more realistic view of what the western expansion may have been like with the building of the railroad so simon bolivar saw this problem emerging he admired the United States, but he also understood that uh, it would become powerful. And so uh, he felt as he f tried to lead the uh, process of uh, separation from the Spanish crown and monarchy and the development of Spanish republics, he tried to promote the idea of a confederation of Spanish American states, sort of a United States of Spanish America, if you will to serve as a counterbalance to the United States. That he attempted to form a uh, Congress, uh, a gathering in 1824 in Panama, but only Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Central America attended. Notice I said Central America. That was before Central America fragmented into several different countries. Brazil and the United States were also invited over his objections. He didn't trust Brazil, and he certainly didn't trust the United States, Simon Bolivar. So the attempt was to make a Spanish America. Uh, his idea at one point was to form a southern bloc with Argentina, Chile, and uh, 
Uruguay and Paraguay uh, and to form an Andean country. Uh, and of course, that was the La Gran Colombia that he tried to uh, lead for a while, consisting of Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, uh, Peru. And uh, also he attempted to uh, encourage Mexico and uh, Central America to stay unified so that there would be three Spanish-speaking countries of significant size to oppose or to form a counterbalance to the United States. Obviously, this didn't happen. There was a, a leadership vacuum after the loss of the Spanish monarch and uh, problems with the Catholic Church and the, the uh, countries. There was also geographic, uh, almost insurmountable geographic barriers, the, uh, the Andes Mountains, the... Uh, the Amazons, the Central America. Um, so it just didn't work out. However, they met uh, numerous times in the 19th century. Only Colombia was willing to ratify the agreement at that point in time. This was called the Bolivarian Dream. If you uh, that sounds familiar to you, that you might have heard uh, um, Comandante Chavez speak of the Bolivarian Revolution, and now Nicolas Maduro in, um, in Venezuela. Uh, there was an attempt to bring together several leftist Spanish countries recently, uh, since 2000, and that included Bolivia with Evo Morales, uh, Nicaragua with uh, Daniel Ortega, uh, Ecuador at one point was in the leftist camp, and Venezuela, and to some degree Brazil under uh, uh, Lula. Uh, this is called, this is a 21st century version of the Bolivarian dream, which obviously didn't work, has not worked out very well. In 1847, there was a meeting in Lima, Peru. Uh, this was uh, partly in reaction to a, a Mexican-American war. Then another meeting in 1856 in reaction to William Walker, which I will talk more about later. He was a filibusterer who attempted to invade Mexico and then later invaded Nicaragua successfully and became the, a dictator of Nicaragua and tried to make bring it into the Union as a slave state. We'll talk about him. 1864, there was a fourth and final gathering in Peru. Then in 1861, Spain reconquered Santo Domingo, that is the Dominican Republic, and created a new crisis. Uh, France also supported the attempt to send, uh, France actually sent troops to Mexico to create a European monarchy in Mexico under Maximilian, an Australian archduke. Gradually, the dream of a union of Spanish states gave away around this time to the idea of Latin America. Instead of Spanish America, now it's Latin America. And uh, that's an important political distinction. Uh, let me just finish up with Latin America. The idea was that Spain was declining and decrepit and could no longer serve as a model, but many Latin, uh, Latin American or Spanish American conservatives wanted to continue to identify with monarchy, with a, with a Hispanic heritage, with Latin, the Latin Southern European heritage that traced back to the Roman Empire, and uh, also with Catholicism. And so their thought was that France was a better source for their identity and a better counterweight to the United States than Spain. And so a number of Spanish intellectuals, or not, I'm sorry, not Spanish, but uh, Spanish American intellectuals in Colombia, Mexico, Peru, began using the term Latin America. And of course, Napoleon III in France uh, didn't mind this at all. And so gradually, Spanish America, which was America in the beginning, became Latin America, and the United States became America. We uh, managed to take the name for the whole hemisphere and appropriate it for ourselves. Okay, that's all for today. I will come back with a uh, 
I think we're going to begin next time with the Spanish-American War. I'm sorry, the Mexican-American War in 1846. Thank you.